Let me tell you about Suda51. Suda51 is a developer known for directing some weird and wacky games. He's responsible for Lollipop Chainsaw, which is a game about a cheerleader fighting off zombie hordes with a rainbow chainsaw, while her decapitated boyfriend's head hangs at her side. He also developed the No More Heroes games, which is about an otaku nerd assassin killing a bunch of other assassins in order to get laid by some sexy Suijus lady. Despite the wacky premises of Suda51's more well-known games, I never found myself interested in buying any of them. All that I end up hearing about these games are about how wacky and hilarious they are, so I only ended up seeing them as just wacky premises with no promise of quality gameplay. I mean, both No More Heroes and Lollipop Chainsaw looked like standard beat-em-up hack-and-slashes with a few gimmicks. Now I'm not saying that they are standard beat-em-up hack-and-slashes with a few gimmicks, I'm just saying that's what they looked like. Then one day, I heard about Killer7, and its premise alone got my attention. The premise being that an assassin with seven personalities with individual skills hunts down targets while fighting off a supernatural squad of suicide bombers. Now, multi-personality disorder is not a new concept to gaming nowadays. I can name a couple of video game characters that have it, such as the dog-god combo from Fallout New Vegas, or Tira from Soul Calibur. But the idea of multiple personalities being a main game mechanic is what sparked my interest in Killer7. Would one be able to change personalities at will, or would the player have to manipulate end-game triggers in order to change personas in the first place? How would the skills vary from the different personas? And could this be just the craziest f***ing game that Suda51 ever directed? Well, I went off and bought it, and now you'll be able to get to find out along with me. Let's begin, shall we? Samantha, the lights. As you wish, Master. I will give you a basic rundown of what's going on in this insane world. In the year 1998, world peace has been obtained. July 3rd, 1998. The day that all international disputes were resolved. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a bit. Are we good? Okay. So the reason there is world peace is because every single country in the world united to create a single global community. In 2000, this community began large-scale efforts in order to keep the peace, including efforts to suppress terrorism and the construction of massive highways that would link all of the continents together. And this, in turn, would cause the shutdown of air travel. By the way, just because I'm able to drive everywhere doesn't mean I'm going to drive hundreds of miles in order to reach Japan. Anyway, in 2003, there was going to be a signing of a worldwide peace treaty at the UN, but then a new group of terrorists, known as the Heaven Smile Group, launched an attack and it brought negotiations of peace to a halt. The world powers then enlisted the help of an assassin known as the Killer Seven, an assassin with seven personalities, each of which contain individual skills and appearance. And in addition to the seven personalities, there's also an eighth personality known as Harmon Smith. A legendary assassin who is supposedly the only one who can kill the man behind the Heaven Smiles, known as Kun Lan. This game's story starts in 2011, where after receiving information on Kun Lan's whereabouts from their informant, Christopher Mills, the Killer7 go after him in hopes of stopping him once and for all. This particular level serves as the tutorial level for the player. When the Killer7 meets Kun Lan, Harmon Smith attempts to take him out, but fails after he catches the bullet and flies out of the building. For the rest of the game, the Killer7 is sent on more missions by the US government to take down numerous threats. As the Killer7 takes down these threats while fighting dozens of Heaven Smiles, many details of the government's activities, specifically their activities involving their relations with Japan, become more apparent, and soon the true nature of these relations reveal themselves alongside the Killer7's true role in all this. Now alongside the main arc, the story also focuses on smaller side stories involving the individual targets the government sends you after, including the insane CEO of a large postal company, See, I told you. the former mentor and murderer of one of the seven personalities who now runs an organ trafficking business, and a group of superheroes known as the Handsome Men, which strongly resemble the Power Rangers. Another huge aspect of the story and gameplay are the spirits of the Killer7's previous victims. While you will see a lot of ghosts and interact with them, there are a few that you see quite frequently. The first spirit you see in the game is a weird looking fellow named Iwazaru. He has pledged his loyalty to the Killer7, after he was killed by them, and he often offers advice and information that can be used to solve puzzles. 
There is also Travis, and he was supposedly the first victim of the Killer7. He harbors a lot of bitterness towards the Killer7 for his death. However, he does offer up a lot of background on the targets you're sent after, and also the political aspects of the plot. There is also Susie, who always appears as a decapitated head, and has a really disturbing backstory. And lastly, there is Yoon Hyun, who used to be the Killer7's informant. He helps the Killer7 solve puzzles in exchange for blood, but is often incredibly rude. I'll say that the story as a whole, for the most part, is pretty good. The story was one of the main motivations for me playing the game, and I found myself always looking forward to what crazy shenanigans would happen next. And I also liked how the story had an edge, meaning that there were darker parts to it that would offset the craziness. Such as the relationship between Harmon Smith and Samantha Smith. What? You wanna eat? However, I have two main problems with the story. One being that the main story can be hard to understand and pick up on, because with all the craziness that goes on in the story, it can be hard sometimes to discern what's important and what's just insane. But thankfully in the game's final parts, they make sure that everything they show you is relevant. My second problem with the main story is that it doesn't take time to let us get to know the individual personalities. Now for contextual reasons, I want to briefly go over who the personalities are. First we have Dan Smith who is an exceptionally skilled assassin, with much confidence in his abilities. However, he does not get along well with the other personalities. Boy, is this a bad time? I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Or am I? There's Katie Smith, who is the only girl of the pack and is really shy and withdrawn, and because of that she prefers to take out targets from a distance. Con Smith is the youngest and in turn the most childlike of the Killer7. He is blind, but his blindness is made up for by his super hearing abilities. Coyote Smith is a thief who grew up on the streets and he can pick almost any lock. Kevin Smith is not the independent film director Kevin Smith, although a character that Kevin Smith plays, known as Silent Bob, is a mute alongside Killer 7's Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith is the only assassin who doesn't use guns, but rather throwing knives. Mask Day Smith used to be a professional wrestler before becoming a part of the Killer 7, and because of that, he is the toughest of the bunch. I've changed my look. Don't make me say it again. I'm a cleaner. Garcian Smith is the least suitable for combat compared to the other personalities. However, he arguably has the most important duties of the Killer 7. He can resurrect the other personalities if they fall in battle, which is why he often refers to himself as the cleaner. He is also the only one who takes all of the assignments, and the only one who talks to Christopher Mills. He is also the only one who is able to communicate with the dominant personality. Harmon Smith. Ah, oh, Garcian. How long has it been? Harmon Smith is the leader of the Killer 7 Assassins, and like Garcian Smith, he is incredibly professional. He is said to be the only one who can kill Kun Lan, using the unstoppable power of the God Killer, employed within his sniper rifle. Now most of the information I just told is stuff I read out of the game's manual. The game doesn't take time to go over the backstories of most of the personalities. The story does briefly go over the backstories of Dan and Mask Day Smith, but all of the other personalities have only very brief moments of dialogue in the Persona selection screen. Okay. <laughs> Judge, I'll take care of them. I've changed my makeup. Did you notice? Ah, men, they never notice. And other than that, you either have to wait until the final levels of the game for some background, or you have to read Hand and Killer 7. Now Hand and Killer 7 was a book released for the sole purpose of explaining the plot of Killer 7 more, and it really helps with giving some more background on the events of the game. You can find a translated version in the Suda51 wiki, however if you are already in the wiki, you might as well just search for the information you need rather than plunging through Hand and Killer 7. However, even without all the backgrounds for the personas present within the game, I still enjoyed the story due to the craziness and a really well done finale. There are a total of six levels in the game, plus a seventh one that unlocks after you complete it. Some of the levels are split into two or more parts, and sometimes the mission objective will change with these splits. 
Each level begins with Garthy and Smith getting information on the next target from Christopher Mills. The Killer7 then enters a level where he will have to fight off Heaven Smiles and solve puzzles as the various personalities. You can switch to any personality on the spot except Garcian. In order to switch to Garcian, you either have to die as one of the other personalities, or switch to him in a Harmon's Room. Harmon's Rooms are checkpoints scattered throughout each level, and occasionally you can save your game in them. You can also upgrade personalities in here, and you can talk to Iwazaru for some reminders in gameplay. Each level or part of a level ends with a boss fight, with either an assassin or a special Heaven Smile enemy. I'm glad to say that each level offers a unique environment for you to explore, and the Harmon's Rooms are spaced almost perfectly apart, in a way that they never feel ridiculously far apart or hilariously close together. And I also like how many of the puzzles have you change the environment around you in various ways, such as when you have to turn on the windmills in the Dominican Republic, or when you have to play mini-games at the carnival level. These types of things are nice touches to the environments that make the environments feel just a bit more immersive. Overall, the levels are really well designed, with maybe the exception of the last one. However, that level, without spoiling anything, was more of a story level than a gameplay level, if you catch my drift. Speaking of gameplay, let's talk about that. Watching someone else play this game, you would think it would be a lot like Resident Evil 4 with the whole standstill and shoot enemies thing. However, there are a lot of pretty noticeable differences, like for example when you start the game. Your character is only allowed to go forwards and backwards on a predetermined path, and the only way you can explore the surrounding environment is to look around by aiming. To navigate any area in Killer7, you have to travel on a straight line until you come across a fork in the road, in which you can either change the path your character is on, or enter a door, or interact with an item. Now this sounds kind of confusing, but to make it even more confusing, let me tell you about the controls for navigating. You hit the X button to move forward instead of the left analog stick, you hit the triangle button to turn yourself around, and you use the left analog stick in conjunction with the X button to change your path. And on top of that, the controls for aiming the gun is R1 to go into aiming mode, left stick to aim, X to fire, and the motherfucking right analog stick to reload. Now I gotta say, that is the weirdest assignment to the right analog stick since Alone in the Dark 2008 had you swinging chairs like a cyborg with a spinal injury. Don't, don't play, uh, don't play Alone in the Dark, by the way. The older ones are fine, but don't play that one. It's, it's, it's bad. So anyway, the controls and the style of navigation, which I'm going to call line navigation, are kind of odd and confusing. But even though my initial impression of them was unfavorable, as I played through the game, they sort of grew on me. I found myself navigating the levels with ease and stopped blaming many of my deaths on the controls. It takes a while to get used to, but you will get used to them eventually. And I think that line navigation has a huge advantage over typical 3D environment navigating. The advantage being that because you are on a restricted path, the environmental design won't confuse the player when navigating, as it would in other games with full 3D navigation. You are always heading directly towards the essential items, locked and unlocked doors, and the plot important story bits. I never got lost once in this game, and I rarely had to check any previous areas for stuff I missed. Now I am not trying to say that I would now rather have line navigation in all games. I mean, a game like Devil May Cry would be a horrible game to use this on. But I will say that it works really well with Killer7's puzzles and combat. <laughs> Let's talk about combat in this game. Whenever you hear evil laughter, that means a heaven smile or a group of heaven smiles are nearby. You will then have to take aim, hit the lock on button to find the enemies, then scan them so that you are able to shoot them. The only one who doesn't need to scan the enemies before shooting them is Garcian Smith. Besides the basic heaven smile enemies, there are dozens of other enemy types that all require their own strategies to defeat, including armored enemies, enemies that spawn other enemies, or enemies that if you don't hit them in the right spot can become an even bigger threat. Some of them, however, not only require different strategies, but specific personalities as well. One of the spawner type enemies can only be killed by hitting its weak spots with Dan Smith's demon shell. And several of the later enemies can only be killed, or more easily killed, by Mask Day Smith's charged attacks. I'm glad that not all the personalities had their own specific enemies that only they could kill, and I'm glad that there is such a wide range of enemies that each of the levels are constantly introducing. It really adds variety to the different enemy encounters. But there are two types of enemies which I really wish weren't in the game. The first type being a giant heaven smile that can only be killed if you hit them in their eye, and if you don't, they fall on top of you and do oodles of damage. I thought the whole idea of critical points was to have the player make a risk-reward decision, 
but the giant smile can't be injured in any other place but the eye. And because of the way the giants move, and the twitchy aiming, you would have to get lucky to get a critical hit. And on top of that, these bastards can spawn right in front of you after entering a new location, giving you barely any time to react. At least they only appear in one level, unlike the other enemy that I hate. This other enemy being the Broken Smile, and what a fitting name for such a broken enemy. These things fly towards you in a figure 8 pattern and they are near impossible to hit. They have a critical spot on the cockpit part, but it may as well not be there because it's the size of an infant's pinky finger, and I never hit it once. I swear, the next time I see something with a wavy or figure 8 pattern I'm just going to lose it because the broken smiles really unnerved me. At least they are much easier to take out with Mask Day Smith's grenades. Now when you decapitate enemies or hit them in critical spots, you will acquire Thin Blood and Thick Blood. Thin Blood is represented by a thin test tube that can be seen in the menu, and when you're about to use a special power. Other than charging your abilities, it can also be used to heal the persona you're playing as. Thick Blood serves as the currency for creating serums in the Harmon's rooms, and these serums are this game's forms of skill points that can be used to upgrade the abilities of the different personas. The upgrades increase damage, accuracy, firing rate, and critical abilities, and as you upgrade them, the assassin will gain new abilities like rapid firing and counter attacking. Now my overall opinion on the blood system is that it works. The upgrades help survive the more difficult parts of the game, and the thin blood adds another risk reward element to the game. The blood system is nothing special, but it works and it serves its purpose. The puzzles in this game heavily revolve around using the different abilities of the personas and your own memory. When personalities are used in puddles, their abilities are primarily used to open up new paths, such as when you are using Coyote Smith's ability to either jump high or pick locks, or when you are using Katie Smith's ability to slit her own wrist to summon the wife of a ghost to break down mystical barriers. Yeah. Sometimes the abilities are used for something other than opening pathways, but for the most part they do the same thing. Most of the puzzles either require you to memorize information to apply at a later location, or uh, put the thingy into the MacGuffin type puzzle. For the most part, I like the puzzles. The thingy MacGuffin puzzles work usually, and the memorization puzzles not only have you memorize information, but also have you decode that information so that you can use it properly. And even though I said the game mostly consists of those two types of puzzles, there are other types that appear that break things up a little, and that is appreciated. However, some of the memorization puzzles expect a little too much of you. When the puzzle has me memorizing amounts of objects, locations of objects, or words, it's fine. But when you have me memorizing the exact contents of several posters plus several crayon drawings, then you are expecting too much out of my brain. It's puzzles like these where you have to pull out a notebook and begin jotting things down unless you have a camera handy. I usually wouldn't mind the whole writing stuff down thing because I think that a game having you write stuff down is kind of cool and immersive. But in a game like Killer7, with this much action and tension, it feels out of place and tedious. As you complete puzzles and fight enemies, you will receive Soul Shells, which are spent at the Vincilium Gate, and that unlocks the boss battles of this game. Boss battles come in two flavors in this game. Heaven Smile Bosses and Crazy Human People. The Heaven Smile Bosses are all about figuring out how to beat them before they reach you and blow up. Most of the bosses can be killed by most of the Killer7, but the boss will sometimes be more susceptible to a certain personality, but that can be a problem at times. Now I don't mind that bosses will favor another personality, however when that particular personality makes the boss too easy, then we have a problem. The first boss can be killed in one hit from Dan Smith's Demon Shell, and much of the later bosses are easily taken down by Katie Smith's long range sniping. Many of those bosses you could win with other personas, but you want to use KD because the bosses usually start far away from you, so you'll end up using KD to get the upper hand. Now not all of the Heaven Smile bosses are like this. The ones that aren't are actually pretty good, but for the most part, they are kind of easy. The Assassin bosses fare much better. Admittedly a couple of them are too easy, such as the Rapid Fire contest, but for the most part they are pretty good. These boss fights are the only bosses that sometimes force you to use a single personality, however the ones that don't restrict you are pretty balanced for the most part. Also, the assassin bosses are the only bosses that don't kill you instantly, so you're more likely to figure out how to beat them in the middle of the fight, making them much less frustrating than the Heaven Smile fights. Though there are some poorly designed bosses, most of the boss fights fared pretty well. They were good enough to get myself pumped up for them whenever I listened to that awesome techno tune that played before every boss.
Overall, I put this game alongside a lot of other good games out there, because this game is one of the greats. It's difficult to name another game that is as crazy as this one, yet still manages to maintain an edge while having a satisfying story. The gameplay does seem weird and restrictive at first, but the further you get through the game, the more you are unable to imagine the gameplay being something else that resembled Resident Evil. Sometimes the levels do get a little difficult, and some of the bosses are kind of frustrating, but overall, this game is incredibly satisfying, and I highly recommend it. That's all I have to say, and thank you for watching.